Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nikkei Rising's Artsy August panel discussion. I will be your moderator, Marissa Kim Nakata, and I'm a committee member for Nikkei Rising, the young adult branch of the Japanese American Memorial, Memorial, Memorial Pilgrimages. Our mission is to connect, educate, and empower young adults in and around the Nikkei community, and our Artsy August campaign was created to highlight and feature artists through weekly Instagram takeovers and this live panel. Before we get started, we want to acknowledge the land we are residing on. Land acknowledgements represent our recognition and, re and respect of the indigenous peoples whose lands we live on. We encourage you to take this as a call to action to learn and share about indigenous American people because we cannot achieve justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion without an understanding of history and context. Please take a moment to think about how you will acknowledge the people of the land you currently inhabit. Thank you. We'll begin with some introductions. Like I said before, my name is Marissa, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm an Okinawan Vietnamese American. I am based in Los Angeles, Tongva land, and I study art history and education in San Francisco, Ramaytush Ohlone land. Today, I'm joined with Okinawan, Repunkuru Ainu, and Japanese American artists, and we'll be discussing art, community, culture, identity, as well as other arts topics. I'd like to welcome our artists to the screen. And we'll start with some introductions. Um, Dan, you can get us started. Uh, hi, Sai, Chu Ganabira, Wane Nakama Dan Yai Bing, Hoi Karachagitan, Nita Sarukutu Nige Savira. Um, hello, my name is Dane. I am a half Japanese, half Uchinanchu artist, currently residing in Hawaii, uh, the land of the Kanaka Maoli. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Okuma Johnston. Um, I am from Seattle, uh, Coastal Salish land. Um, I identify as Shin Issei Hafu um, or Daburu. Um, and I'm also excited to be here today. Hi, I'm, uh, my name is June Osaki. Um, I'm calling from uh, Dakota and Anishimaabe land, um, also known as um, Minnesota. And yeah, been a tattooer for like 10 years. And yeah, thanks for having me. Rankarapte Kanenakne Seta Kunirene. I am Rupunkuru Ainu. Uh, my family is from Shiro'oi Kotan in Yon Moshiri. Um, I was born in uh, Tuhtu Abish land, um, and I'm broadcasting from Hadscot on Ihualis on Tuhlelip land. Thank you for your introductions, artists. And to our audience members, if there are any questions you would like to ask them, please leave them in the chat. Um, to start us off, I have a question for you all, and it is, what themes, ideas, questions do you explore in your work? And by work, meaning like your arts practice, how you integrate it in your own career, your social justice activism and advocacy, and how have those themes, ideas, questions changed you or how you perceive yourself and the world? And Dane, we can start again with you. Awesome. Um, that's, a, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> I usually say my work really starts off from the point of acknowledging art accessibility. So my practice, um, though it ranges greatly, um, primarily consists of painting and ceramics, as well as other multimedia works. Um, I've had the privilege of showing in galleries um, across the United States and a little bit in Japan. And a lot of it is to address the hierarchies that exist within the arts context already. Um, and the means of which I've chosen to dismantle that is through my own identity. So um, navigating a multicultural identity that is a hybrid diaspora, what does it mean to make work that you know, is fluid, um, addresses social spaces and whatnot. Uh, so in short, it's just a lot. It's a, it's a wide variety of topics. Yeah. Thank you. And then Marie, we can go in the same order that we had the introductions. 
<laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I guess so for you know me with art, um, I was recently invited from, I was someone who always just liked to doodle in notebooks and things like that. And then I had someone from the Minidoka Pilgrimage Committee invite me to start helping out with making merchandise. And then it was from there that I realized that um, I could step into a space of art to just kind of unpack my own experiences and really explore my own lens of how I view the world. And so um, recently I've been really focusing on digital painting and thinking about um, how my processing mental health, especially in relations to um, current events, but then even looking further about how a lot of, um, you know, just classical traditional Japanese art has really been um, kind of tokenized. And so just kind of finding ways on reclaiming it um, and thinking about how I want to kind of connect with my own experiences, um, you know, living in Japan and um, being Shinto and Buddhist and looking at how do I want to express that through my art, but also acknowledging my um, lens of also living in the US. And so kind of just exploring all of that right now and trying to see how it all um, comes together. And I think it's been a great tool for me to really just unpack my own experiences um, and really reflect on just what it means to just be, I suppose. And that makes, I mean, that we have a lot of time in the pandemic, like since lockdown, a lot of us have been inside and we have that time to reflect and think about ourselves and our identity. Um, June, would you like to go next? Yes, sure. Um, I, you know, I mostly explore themes of like, I don't know, nature because I like to be outside, but also I feel like in, it's been important in the recent years to like, for it to be part of like, um, like my cultural identity as well as being like Japanese. And like, I don't know, uh, I feel like I wasn't really around much of it when I was growing up. So it's been kind of like a way for me to like, kind of explore more traditional arts and also understand like, especially in tattooing, um, like just like trying to navigate like what, like especially like cultural appropriation of like Japanese art and even age, just Asian art in general in tattooing. Um, I feel like I'm like kind of see, like I feel like me doing like actual like Asian art as a Japanese person is like, helps me understand a little bit more context of like what it means for like non-Japanese people um, to be like, doing this kind of art too. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Um, also heavy themes of just like existing as like a person or like the experience of existence, I guess. Yeah, feelings and like mental health, things like that. Yeah, yeah thank you so much for sharing June. Mm -hmm. And Seta, would you like to finish us off? Yeah, um, I gotta be honest, like so much of my uh, my art is just about making myself happy. And like, you know, um, uh, thinking of a story or telling a story that I want to see that I haven't seen in other places, like in pop culture and media and stuff. Um, like I am, I love movies and I hate them so much at the same time. Um, and I'm always, um, you know, if I can't find a, a story that I want to hear about, um, then I'm kind of of the mind like, well, I'll just go write it myself. Um, and, uh, a lot of that kind of comes out in my illustrative work as well, because, uh, the illustrative work is a little bit easier to share than, um, uh, the, the sort of personal writing that I do. Um, and, but a lot of the illustrations that I do, um, almost all of them kind of come out of this uh, story place that I'm always uh, navigating in my own head. Um, and a lot of the things that uh, um, inspire or are addressing um, are things that we go through all the time. Um, so in this project that I'm working on, um, 
it deals it it kind of it deals a little bit with um living through these seemingly unstoppable powers of like capitalism imperialism industrialism and these kinds of things that are just so much a part of our lives that they're almost it's difficult to get out from under those topics so addressing them directly is kind of a way to process a lot of those things um and a lot of my uh artwork comes out of um processing the systems that process us every day thank you so much for sharing i loved hearing all of your themes and ideas that you're all sharing um, and I know that you talked about this, I think you all talked about this during your Instagram takeovers that we had, but I had some questions, like individualized questions about identity and art. And in diaspora, it is difficult to navigate who we are and you know our negotiation in the relationships between us, our family, our communities, and with the actual land and immigration borders. So I wanted to start off with um, Seta and you are Rapunkuru Ainu, and so I wanted to ask, what has been your experience in claiming your identity and learning about history, as well as like you were sharing, like sharing your story and activism through your art? It's kind of complicated because it's, um, it's, it's hard to quantify um, because like, there's a lot of joys that come with it and a lot of heartbreak that comes with it. Um, but I think that the joy that you find in connection, that kind of um, sustenance, that inner sustenance that comes with, um, you know, kind of your own heritage work um, and, um, trying to kind of, I, I, I find art very spirit, kind of like very spiritual in a way as somebody who's not, who didn't grow up in kind of a religious context. Um, art is a way that we kind of communicate or negotiate with our ancestors or with like Kumui, which is a very, very uh, general um, description of Kumui is everything that is outside of human control. Um, and art is one of the few things that is exclusively in human control. So that kind of exchange of, you know, creating something and putting it out there is kind of, um, one of the few almost divine acts that human beings are capable of. Um, and I find that kind of very empowering um, as well, this kind of, um, this cultural uh, respect for um, human creation outside of like exclusively procreation. Um, and I, I, there's a lot, a lot of navigating some of the harder. I think that's where this, where uh, the storytelling and the processing kind of helps in that it transforms the the hard, tragic, toxic, um, you know, traumatic things that are our, um, you know, our ancestors have experienced that we've experienced being able to take all of these things and then transform them into um, something beautiful or cathartic or emotional or touching or connective. Um, this kind of um, emotional alchemy that comes out of that. I think that's very valuable and very healing um, if we can kind of like tap into that, I, that, um, the idea that what you do is worthwhile and what you create is valuable, even if you don't get, um, necessarily outside validation or monetary validation, but a lot of that can really, where that 
sort of emotional currency comes in is when you're navigating some of these own, some of the really dark stuff that comes with um, learning about your own people's history. I think that's kind of what sustains it, what keeps it going instead of just being overwhelmed by the breadth and depth of history. Um, I think art is a way to like really personally process all of that in a powerful way. Mm -hmm. And like these themes that you're talking about, like reclamation and healing, these things are very interge intergenerational as well. And as we learn about these heritage and history and all of our families come from different places as well. Um, and so my next question is for June. And so you were born in Japan, but then you moved to the US when you were very young. Um, what was your process in connecting with your culture or learning about your heritage, um, as well as becoming involved in the tattoo, the tattoo field and advocating for BIPOC artists? Um, to start off, like, uh, I guess, to connecting to my culture, it was pretty limited. Um, I mean, my I had grandparents who sent me like, tapes of anime and like cartoons and like, manga and things like that, um, some food. Um, my mother was my only kind of like, day to day connection and consistent, um, and still is my primary. I mean, I've like, through my, especially through my tattoo work, I've like met a lot of, um, not just like Japanese people, but like Asian diaspora in general. Um, I feel like, especially in the West Coast, um, I haven't, I hadn't uh, met a lot of like Japanese people in general in the Midwest, um, especially where the area that I'm from. Um, and so that's been really important. Um, as far um, I don't know, as far as like advocating for like BIPOC, um, it's just been like through knowing other artists and like just hearing people's experiences and stories in the industry and not just like, definitely like a lot of clientele, right? Of like, you know, people who like are turned away or like discriminated against because of like, they have darker skin, right? So, and I hear it from artists too. And I think the important part is like, you know, the people who have experienced um, these like, being discriminated and like, you know, racism, colorism. Um, I think it's important for them to be, to have the voice in being like, this is how you, like it's possible to tattoo black skin, right? Like it's possible to tattoo darker skin. Like it's not like what a lot of people, like, it's not like what a lot of, um, like the people who have been tattooing, you know, which is mostly just like older white dudes doing, you know, traditional American tattooing. Um, and so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, it did. Thank you so much. Like yeah. I think the intersectionality between BIPOC communities and then the arts field is so broad and diverse. And I think that it's great that we're you know, coming together even here in this space to be able to talk about it and share our knowledge and experiences. So yeah, thank you so much. These questions are very long and multifaceted, um, but so Marie, my next question is for you. And um, so you grew up attending school uh, during the US school system and then during your summer breaks, you would go to school in Japan. So I was wondering how has this experience shaped your arts practice and your um, identity, as well as how you connect with and build community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say so, you know, going from September to June was when I would be in the States. And I went to an elementary school where there were only two people of color. Um, we both happened to be Japanese Americans. Um, so had 
a lot of great experiences of being called racial slurs and being tokenized quite a bit during that time. But then when I um, would fly over and attend school in Japan, I was the only white person in a very large radius because I lived in a pretty small town. Um, and so that led to the experience where, you know, people didn't necessarily call you racial slurs to your face or anything, but people would talk bad about you in Japanese in front of you, expecting you not to understand them. And so, you know, as I've kind of been exploring art more and navigating art more, I think it's kind of just creating a space for being able to process and to be able to, you know, as I mentioned before, just creating a space where you're able to be. And so, you know, I've even talked with people about how I've been working with the Minidoka Pilgrimage um, Planning Committee and creating merchandise um, for them and all of that. Um, and that's been a really great process to create art and kind of think about, um, just kind of reflect on the Issei experience and my experiences of kind of carrying um, what I've seen in Japan and what I've seen over here, but also as an independent artist, not wanting to ride the coattails of trauma either. And so kind of looking at um, when I've done community work, like that art has been that community's work that I've been invited to take part in. But then when I'm creating something on my own, really reflecting on like what is going to make me happy, what's going to help me be able to, you know, think more about what does it mean to um, be, you know, um, Hafu, like I'm the first POC in my dad's side of the family and I'm the first white person on my mom's side of the family and so um I think art's just like it's like my own little bubble <laughs> where I'm like I'm just gonna be myself <laughs> and just kind of do what um do what I want to do um but really just think about um you know I look out my window and I you know see the Seattle right and then um but then thinking about the time I spent in my Bachan's place and looking out the window and um just the sights, the smells, the sounds that I see over there and how can I fuse the two together um, as a form of expression. Um, and just really just taking time to kind of process that strange experience of what it did mean to um, be able to, to be able to travel. Cause you know, also recognizing like there's a lot of privilege in being able to travel, but also knowing like the sacrifices my family made in order to even make that a possibility. Um, and so also finding gratitude um, and just what my parents had to do in order to even make that possible. So art's just kind of a way to encompass all of that um, for me and just be able to just create a space to just, just think about it more, I suppose, think about it more intentionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I think that um, in the capitalist society, it's so hard to be able to feel comfortable in creating art for ourselves and for our own happiness and healing because there is that um, myth that we always need to be productive and producing things for society and for other people and it's I think it's really great to hear you all saying you know that you're creating art for yourself and for your own growth and healing um, so thank you so much and Dane my last question of, of the art identity questions is so you are a fourth generation Japanese Uchinanshu living in Hawaii and so what was it like for you you know learning about the history and intersections of the relationships between, um, you know, Okinawa, Japan, as well as like America and Hawaii. And then how do you relate that to your arts practice? And you're muted right now. Oh, am I still muted? No, you're good, you're good. Okay, fantastic. There was a bit of a lag. Um, I will say it hasn't been until like the past, pandemic period where I really started to correct people and like acknowledge like, oh, I am Japanese Uchinanchu because like many Uchinanchus, um, it's just a lot easier to identify as Japanese. Um, and kind of in that sense, and we're, as we're talking about like our relationship to arts and identity and whatnot, I'm, I personally am a firm believer that all art is political. Um, you're either choosing to acknowledge a history that is underrepresented or misrepresented or needs to have a co further conversation in it or you're choosing not to engage with that. Um, and so in more recent, you know, and that can manifest in many different ways for anybody. But personally, once the pandemic period hit, um, there was this really awesome kind of thing happening where all, it was kind of interesting, all like Uchinantris from all over the world just like, were like, oh, let's like get into this simultaneously and they all found each other um 
online and that was crazy. And so I like had started taking traditional Udui lessons, um, court dancing lessons, studying the language. And also it painted a better picture as far as like I having been influenced by Japanese culture and arts history for so much of my practice, switching over to Chinanchu culture and realizing how much of a deficiency, not deficiency, but lack thereof, um, of such a culture and representation where it was very, very easy um, to acknowledge like histories of Japanese visual culture and it's very, very limited, like having to even read articles in Japanese that are also mistranslating Uchinaguchi to an extent, like it was, it was a constant battle. Um, and also growing up in Hawaii, I had this strange relationship to the term Japanese American because I personally don't really consider Hawaii to be part of America. Um, it's such a different culture and it's such a different diaspora and that it, it was just very confusing. And But more recently, I will say that it wasn't until I had gone to university, both in Japan briefly and in California, that I realized that my the specificity to my identity and how many layers and hybrid natures there are to the identity is what gave me a lens through which people had been more interested in, where the, you know, the minute details to one's identity that is missing from this general conversation in art and art history are what people are hungry for, you know? Like I had reluctantly not made work about being Japanese Uchinanchu, not being from Hawaii for so long because I just thought nobody would care about it. But for, quite frankly, it is that variation and, you know, vibrancy of history that is missing from the narrative that people need to hear more so. Um, yeah, in short, that's what, it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. And like you were saying about the Uchinanshu community, like really finding each other online. I think that's how I also got more involved in the Uchinanshu community, um, like with things like Discord and other like pen pal programs, like we're being able to meet so many other people. Um, and I guess that leads into my next question where it was like, I was wondering how social media and being able to connect with each other through virtual spaces, like how has that affected your artist's journey or your arts practice and what role do you think social media plays in the arts field and that's for everyone but um Jane would you like to start off this one? Ooh, this is a question that's like I, <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows but I like got banned from TikTok this morning and so I'm like oh I have a love-hate relationship right now <laughs> I'm just what's happening but um <laughs> I will say over the course of the, you know, again, uh, the pandemic changed a lot of things for a lot of people, especially in the realm of social media. But I was able to have the opportunity to, in, you know, interact with a huge community of people um, that kind of came out of nowhere, and it was about conversations about art. And I think this is something I've been kind of interrogating myself about consistently, having gone to an institutional practice from like an art school, the kind of pathways one has to take to infiltrate the art world, um, being affiliated with that and, and understanding that, but also jumping into social media where quite frankly, a lot of, to a lot of people is kind of a taboo or no, no for fine artists for their art to be at such a wide value or so accessible to a large view. Cause it's like, you're not, no longer a uh, um, exclusive commodity, right? Um, which again is completely enraveled in elitism and toxicity that exists, exists in the art world. But I have come to the belief that art institutions like museums and schools were imposed in place um, because for a large portion of the human history, there were only a select few of individuals who had the liberty of engaging with art, had the liberty of educating themselves in visual literacy, had the liberties of just being quote unquote cultured. Um, whereas nowadays in the age of the internet, knowledge is accessible, you know, to a vast, vast majority of people. People, I've learned so much about primarily everything I know about art and art history nowadays not from school, I kind of knew it before school, was through YouTube and like just random videos I would find, right? 
And so the idea of the institution or art academia to me has brought it up to the internet where conversations of critical theory, conversations of art appropriation, discourse, um, what does it mean to have accessible work? What does it mean to have representation? All of that's happening on TikTok, in YouTube comment sections, right? That criticality is now vast. Um, and I don't know, I think I think everyone's relationship to social media is different. And, and I will say that mine has been love-hate, a lot of negativity. Um, but I will say that the internet I'm feeling a lot, but the internet is a tool so new to humanity that of course we're not gonna know how to use it right now. You know, we have to really engage with it, learn the vocabulary, learn an etiquette to it in which it won't be so detrimental to our mental health, right? But can actually do quite amazing things. It starts movements. It like creates communities that were not there, you know? Um, so yeah, in short, I think Personally, my relationship to art and the internet in general is that it's just starting for us to know what its capacity is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I was also wondering, like, since you started off on like art history, TikTok, what was it like to suddenly have so many people viewing your videos and thinking about these ideas um, on TikTok and Instagram? What was that like? Um, it's honestly kind of funny because I joined TikTok so that it wasn't art related. Like that was my specific intention because I was like, I do literally everything I've done in my life has been art related. And I had a professor who even ask me, oh, hello, dog. Um, <laughs> but even ask me, like, what do you do besides art? And I had no answer to that. And I kind of freaked me out. And so I was like, I'm going to join TikTok. I'm going to do some dances, um, really like escape. That went down the drain. Um, but it really, for me, again, because my practice has been so focused or fixated on art accessibility for a long time, I just thought previously, like I, it would be through only my art practice or through teaching in person at university. Like that was my career path. That was my goal and whatnot. And it was really exciting and honestly like empowering to see a video take off and be like, this is a conversation that frankly for years has been left only in the classrooms of these specific institutions. And why, and me just like mentioning it and having an interest beyond that um, was so liberating and so exciting because I, I was able to even go to class when I was still in college, I'd be like, look, people, can talk like us, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, like having to tell artists specifically, like, we don't just have to talk to each other, you know, like, it's great that we have each other, but people, you know, art isn't meant to be misunderstood by so many people, you know, and it doesn't have to be anymore. Um, so I don't know, in that moment, it was like, wow, it is possible to somehow dismantle this hierarchy. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It was just so exciting. And I'm still very scared by how it works. <laughs> yeah, the internet, social media, it's pretty terrifying and it can change on you like super fast. Um, but yeah, I wanted to pose the same question to the rest of our panelists and I can say it again. Um, how has social media changed your artistic journey and, and or your arts practice? And what role do you think that social media plays in the arts field? And uh, Marie, could we start with you? Sure, and sorry, sorry, Dane, Taro just started barking. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I, I was thinking about the whole, you know, the, like, there's the anonymity of internet that can be really toxic, but there's also the part where you can kind of find your niche communities that I've really appreciated, where, you know, I remember, um, like, when YouTube first started and, like, content, cre con content creators would, like, talk with their people in the comments and then you would talk to other people and it was, like, you know, the parents were, like, be careful with who you meet on the internet and stuff. But, like, the number of people I know who made, like, very real friends who were within these circles um, because they were able to find people that were kind of part of their niche group. And I think for me personally, like, I'm still figuring out how I want to navigate that. 
Um, yeah, I have a pretty small Instagram account where I just kind of post what I feel like posting, but I follow a lot of like different, um, you know, on Twitter, on um, TikTok, on Instagram, you know, I just follow artists I really like just because I like their work and kind of seeing their process and hearing their conversations. And I think like there has been, um, you know, I've been able to connect with some really wonderful um, artists and have really great conversations. Um but I've also, like me personally, I definitely use social media for like the tutorial aspect <laughs> that a lot of artists that I follow, I try to learn from um, and kind of, um, you know, just see what their process is and try to see like, how can I um, continue to grow in my own way, um, going all the way back to when I first watched a YouTube video on how to use Photoshop, because I wanted to learn how to do a face replace meme of all my friends. Like, you know, just that, that was kind of like how I first started learning stuff like in design and Illustrator. Um, and so that's where I've been really appreciative of the internet and how it's been offered as a resource. But I agree on just having that love-hate relationship where I sign in and some days I'm like, no, <laughs> like not today. Um, and there's other days where I'm just so grateful that um, as someone who um, has never had really very many opportunities to like take art lessons and stuff, like it's been really great of just being able to find um, that type of content of people I want to support. Um, and people who want to also just support and get back to the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And like in the past couple of years, I think especially with the pandemic, like the internet and the accessibility of it has expanded so immensely. And then that's also a topic though, you know, like um, the accessibility of Wi-Fi and internet and being able to have social media and having to create content and all that. Um, but yeah, continuing with the question, June, would you like to answer it as well? Sure. Um, I joined, I mean, Instagram has been the biggest thing, but I joined Instagram like a year after I started tattooing. So most of my career has been built through uh, social media and it's been, yeah, with anything, it's positive and negative. Um, so there's a important to have a balance there, but um, yeah. I think one of the more important things is like being connected to both other artists and like finding other artists and people to talk to and like community in that way, especially through the pandemic. And even not just like other artists, but also like audience um, and like clientele for myself. Um, I would not be here without like that, honestly. I would not be like, I feel like as successful as I have been. Um, and I think more recently, um, especially with, it's especially been important with like connecting to like other artists of color and even like, um, like I recently joined like a Jap like specifically a Japanese, um, like at first it was like an Asian, abolition group but then it i like found a more specific one where it's like japanese people abolition group and i was like that's pretty dope um and yeah i feel like i can't take that for granted that's like really important to have be able to make those connections you know and also like to have like the access to those resources like to be able to have internet and like a phone and to know how to use it too. It's like, yeah, huge mm -hmm. privilege. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember you talking on your Instagram takeover a little bit about like the privilege of being able to connect back to culture and community. Could you speak a little bit about that as well? Yeah. Um, I think that, I don't know, I guess having talked to like a lot of other, like, like having met more, not just Asian people, but other people of color who are like trying to connect with like who they are and like their cultural identities. I feel like there are so many factors that are barriers, right? Like I think a lot of the things that I mentioned about like your geographical location, um, whether you were like adopted or biracial, multicultural, um, and also if your like cultures were affected by like, you know, imperialism, war, genocide, things like that, right? Like in colonization, um, all of these things like affect, um, yeah, like how you connect with culture. And I think that 
I mean, the internet definitely like makes it easy, right? Like you, um, Dane was saying, you know, like you can connect with other like Uchinanji people, and it's I think it's really valuable. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, 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 it does. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, like the accessibility of being able to connect with other people. Like I think I first heard about Seta through like Jamp, the I knew activism. And then I saw that you were also on the Uchinanshu Discord. And I saw you posting like so many different resources. And I was like, whoa, this is cool. Like I didn't know any about like any of this. So Seta, what was it like for you to um, go into social media or like what role do you think it plays in the arts field? How has it affected your arts practice? I feel like so much of social media is just MMO group therapy. And um, it's just, I hate social media. Um, I hate social media. I hate, I don't think that art and, and commerce are compatible at all. I think they're mutually exclusive ideas. And art exists in ghettos on the internet where it's frequently swept by just rampant capitalism, advertising, censorship. All, every social media, every Western social media platform is built by and for white supremacists. And I would, I would argue that Dane getting ba uh, banned from TikTok is social media correcting the democratization of the internet. And that's what all of these like algorithm is white nerd speak for uh, racism we can argue for. Um, and I loathe fighting inch by tooth and nail to show pictures on the McDonald's version of photo imaging like sharing sites on Instagram. It sucks. Um, it's, it's just <laughs> um, especially with how much it like punishes females, the female body, um, femmes, queer, you know, like, you know, just the whole thing. It's just like, I'm, I'm tired of it. Um, I'm tired of the open, uh, unchecked hypocrisy of it all. And uh, we should throw it in the garbage and make something new. But in the meantime, um, I feel like I have uh, met, you know, all of us, all of the connections that we make um, in spite of all of this. Everything that BIPOC people achieve is, is in spite of these systems um, instead of because of it. And I think that um, because we necessarily have to strategize and and like fight and not waste time with people who are who uh, aren't on our side I feel like that can forge some pretty strong connections even when you're so geographically or even nationally separate um, and I when I kind of started my I knew journey which all of us Rupunkuru go on this sort of like reverse childhood in our adulthoods of, you know, becoming an I knew person and not, and deconstructing these uh, colonial ideas, deconstructing American. Um, I, when I first started out on this, I was flat out told that there are no I knew people in America. And I'm like, that can't even be statistically true. The outrageousness of that statement sort of reveal it it revealed itself, like that lie was telling on itself. Well, like, I'm here, my family here. And I know we are not the only ones in the history of human migration, you know, to set foot on this side of the water. Um, and what was weird is like I was uh, told that by other I knew people 
Um, there was somebody in academia. I, me- I emailed them and I'm like, oh, this was very early on. I'm like, oh, you, you know, hi, how's it going? Uh, what's up, Butari? Uh, are there any like I knew communities? Like I was just asking people, are there any communities? Are there any organizations? Um, because of course we all know about organizations like JAC, uh, JACL, uh, <laughs> JACL, um, and these uh, like Nikkei organizations and stuff. They don't have any knowledge or interest in the Ainu side of things, uh, and so there's no support. There's like no structural support for any of that kind of stuff. And so to an individual I knew person alone in their own communities, that means there are no I knew in America. And I just by kind of putting myself out there, I realized it was letting other people kind of showing some people that oh, it's okay to even identify as I knew, or that um, that would mean something to anybody else. Um, I was in a, I joined a First Nations group at my college um, and we're doing our sort of like round table introductions where uh, we, you know, say our names and um, the tribes or, um, you know, nations that we identify with. And um, I had mentioned that I was, I knew, and another woman who was representing as Kanaka Maoli was <gasps> said, oh, my God, I'm I knew, too. I, you know, didn't think that anybody would. I never thought I'd hear, hear another person like say that. And so, like, if she hadn't if I hadn't said anything or another I knew person wasn't there, she would have just represented herself as Kanaka because nobody else is necessarily. Um, uh receptive to that or like you know you don't necessarily want to explain or you know the set or the other thing you don't have necessarily a stronger connection or that's where a lot of people like our our connection to our ancestors was so violently damaged um there's such um the uh there's this like this invisible I knew syndrome where so much of our survival um, has been through, a, you know, the assimilation, like saying that we're Japanese um, kept women safe from sexual slavery. It kept um, people, it, it gave people, it allowed people to eat in the plantation system in the kingdom of Hawaii, um, you know, like all these sorts, it, it allowed people to have employment by hiding Ainu Nis. Um, and so many of these things are like, you know, our ancestors, our ancestors did so much by just getting us to this point and they had to do it all in secret. Um, and so I really, um, kind of respect the, the fact that, um, I'm able to do this safely. I'm able to say without fear of my physical, um, and personally to a, a, big extent psychological safety um and it's i don't know i've i've been maybe kind of just talking about all of this stuff um online and um meeting other people who identify and us kind of like um really creating this little community online um we were re- able to um uh like lift each other up augment each other's work there's so many people who work in diverse fields and we're able to like piece and we're piecing our history together um and creating kind of like this new community out of that 
Um, and none of that would be possible um, outside of social media, I think, to a large extent, because so many of us are so um, kind of uh, isolated. Um, uh, like culturally, socially, um, like every, I, like almost every I knew person I've talked to outside of the kingdom of Hawaii, um, thought to some extent that they were like the only I knew person in their area, in their state, in the country. Um, and I've talked to I knew from, uh, you know, from Hawaii to uh, Washington State to Appalachia to West Virginia to, you know, uh, uh, like uh, Eastern Europe, um, folks in uh, 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 Turkey. There seems to be a, uh, a pretty big population of Ainu diaspora in Turkey um, and a lot of there's like so many communities that are um, uh, one of the last great barriers I think is just the language barrier um, which is what is uh, still uh, that's one of our biggest hurdle uh, hurdles still with the social media and the connectivity and everything is the mm -hmm. language barriers. I'm pretty sure Google three is go or Google translate is going to start world war three. Some of these like terrible translations we're trying to navigate through. Um, and so it's just such a, it's almost like the internet itself is another just capitalist empire. We're surviving through. Um, and that just kind of comes with all of the positives and negatives it, uh, that come with interacting with human beings uh, mm -hmm. anywhere. You know, it's like the bus stop. You just, you know, am I going to make a friend today? Am I going to get shot in the face? Is somebody going to like pee in the corner? I don't know. It's, uh, but that kind of mix also really broadens your um, appreciation for just different types of people um, or at least it I think if you can you know balance some of that it can definitely um, help you process other perspectives stuff that's just totally different or um, you know, it's a, it's a big, scary maze full of monsters and sometimes treasure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the internet, so vast, full of good, bad things, like the final frontiers, learning about all the other people of our own planet. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much uh, for answering those questions. Um, for our audience, if you have any questions you would like for our artists to answer, please put them in the chat. And um, another question I have is, what is something that, this is for everyone, what is something that you've learned in connecting with your community, culture, or history that you'd like for others to know, like whether that be in your journey or something that is special about your identity or your family that you'd like to share uh, with our viewers at home or just in general? Uh, Marie, would you like to start for us? like I might need time uh, <laughs> but um, I guess yeah something I learned with community and culture um, I think just working with um, you know a, primarily a lot of my work has been with the um, incarceration story and you know the incarceration experience um, and history and looking at um, you know how can we how can, how can we do the work to kind of continue the carrying on the voices um, of, you know, the elders who are, are passing away? Like, you know, thinking about when I went on my first pilgrimage and 
the number of people who I interacted with and pulled me aside and told me, um, you know, their experiences at the site um, are, you know, no longer with us. And so thinking about like, how can I continue the work of preserving their legacy and being able to, um, I don't know, like how to, how to navigate that, especially as someone who identifies as Shinise, um, of how can I protect the story, um, and be able to, you know, support this history and this legacy that I'm ultimately benefiting from. Um, because when I, you know, came to the U S it just all of it, you know, um, has been a result of the, the past trauma, um, and experiences that have happened. And so, um, I think, you know, my experiences of working with the community, like, um, you know, one of the pieces I did was the WPA poster, um, for Minidoka and, you know, for national parks and that experience of talking about like originally, um, we were about, we were, our original design had the guard tower in it, but then we had, um, a survivor who worked with us on the project say like, I'm tired of the guard tower always being the symbol. Um, I'm tired of the symbol of oppression always being center fold. And so that invited a reflection where we changed it from the guard tower to the water tower. Cause that was like a big visual cue for people being like, Oh, let's meet at this place. Or it's something that people always saw that isn't necessarily always the barbed wire and always like the guard tower. And so I think what I'm really learning is to, be able to navigate like not speaking for a community but being able to speak alongside with a community and just being really grateful for the invitation to be able to do this work and how this invitation has led to you know my own unpacking um and so i don't know if like if that's something i learned that is you know articulated in any particular way but um i think that's just a journey that i've been continuing through these conversations and i'm grateful of organizations like densho and suited for solidarity and um you know 50 objects like there's just all these orgs out there that have been having these um conversations and talking about the legacy and the way history is presenting itself today um and just thinking about that greater conversation and how do i how do i fit into that how do i fit into these conversations about the parallels with detention centers now um how do i fit in with these conversations about ebay taking artifacts and you know auctioning them off um and so just just continuing that process of just having these discussions and making sure that these you know that voices are heard and voices are represented and especially not forgotten um and thinking about voices now that could be forgot that could be seen as forgotten years later um just like the kids in detention centers today so hopefully that answers the question <laughs> yeah yes thank you so much um june would you like to piggyback off that yeah can you um, can you repeat the question? Yeah, of course. Um, it was, what is something that you've learned in connecting with your community or history or culture that you'd like others to know or that you'd like to share about? Hmm. I think, I think simply put, I think more people or everyone should be proud of who they are, especially culturally. I feel like if you have the opportunity and the resources to do so, you know, dive into it as much as you can and yeah, find ways to express that, whether it's like as an artist um, or whatever, writing, journaling, or even just like, even if it's just for yourself, you know, I feel like that helps with like encompassing, like, or figuring out like, you know, all the, complicated aspects of like identity and like yeah simply put just be proud of who you are and where you come from no matter how complicated it is yeah thank you thank you so much and Santa, would you like to go next yeah um one very important lesson i've learned that uh i'd like to share that uh like you know, people sharing is that Joman is a type of pottery and not a group of people. Thank you, wise knowledge. And finishing up with Dane. 
Um, I think the one one thing that I uh, have been trying to better word is um, whenever someone comes to me asking about their cultural or having shared their cultural background and relationship to that identity, um, there's one like outstanding truth is that we are all innately connected to that history, whether we acknowledge it or not, and know it by its name. Um, I think that's something that's very important for people to know that any person is here because of some legacy or some history that came before them. And whether that history was stripped away from you, whether that history has just been looked over, or whether that history is right in your left hand, right? It's, it's there. Um, and it's possible to access it in any capacity. Um, it's just, and some, it's most certainly difficult, more difficult for than others, but just knowing that it's there does so much for one's being right now. You know, like, I think it's a beautiful idea to know that, you know, this world is already so chaotic and it's already so hard to exist at any time um, in any place. Knowing that you are not there alone that that legacy or that history has been there for you all along just helps being a person, you know? Um, so that's something that I would like to share with everybody is just knowing that it's there, um, whether you want it or not, but it's it's nice to have just as a resource, yeah. Thank you. And we're coming up on time, but before we go, um, so our artist links and socials are in the video description, but I also wanted to give you all the opportunity to plug your socials, upcoming projects and events. Um, we can go in the order of like Dane, Marie, June, Seta. Um, I am Umeboy on TikTok, Umeboy underscore on Instagram and or at by Dane Okama on Instagram. Uh, projects coming up. I might have a zine article and maybe like a thing. Oh, actually I'm not, oh, I don't think I was supposed to talk about it. Never mind. Never mind. But it's always it's okay. It's, I know this is recording and everything, but it's, it's totally fine. Um, but there's something else coming up. <laughs> I was supposed to. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Thank you for sharing, uh, Marie. Yeah. Uh, so my art Instagram is m dot okuma johnston. Um, my personal one, if you want to follow me, is Marito Bonito. Um, but, um, uh, I guess one upcoming projects, I got my first grant. Woo. Um, and so I am currently working on producing a full deck of Hanafuda cards where I've taken the, um, you know, Hanafuda originates with viewing like scenery around Japan and it's being changed to, um, represent scenery around the camps. Um, more information is available on my website, but, uh, we're going to work on creating it into um, educational kits for museums, schools, community centers, all that. Um, and then it's up to individual pilgrimages how they want to move forward with that. Um, but yeah, so that'll be happening <laughs> this year. Uh, has to happen this year. So yeah. How exciting. Thank you so much for sharing. And then June. Uh, my social is a junkie sock, A J U N K Y S O C K. Um, I'll just be doing what I'm usually doing. I don't have anything huge coming up, but I just recently moved to um, Minneapolis to work. So if you're in the area, hit me up and yeah. Hey. Thank you. And Seta? Yeah, my, uh, <clears throat> my personal uh, Instagram is. Tara underscore Reggio, that's T A R A underscore R E G I O. Um, and my Ainu exclusive um, Instagram is Rupunkuru, that's R E P U N K U R U. Um, and there I like to share um, pictures um, and uh, uh, art uh, stories from um, diaspora I knew. Um, so if there's any uh, diaspora I knew out there who want to share any stories, they just living it up. Um, you know, you can DM me there. Um, I also had a blog on Tumblr called Amer I knew. That's A M E R dash A I N U. And I'm on a bit of a hiatus on that because, to be totally honest, I've misplaced my credentials. 
Um, but I think I kind of needed a little bit of a break from Tumblr anyway. Um, but I've written a lot of stuff um, on that blog that you can kind of like go through if you're so inclined. I've written things about like, you know, my thoughts on the 2019 I knew bill. Spoilers, it's garbage. Um, just different kind of um, some of it's on culture. Some of it's a little, some of it's kind of didactic, like, oh, this is what this symbol means on the thing. Um, and some of my own thoughts and arts there too. So that's kind of a grab bag. Um, if you're, if you want to go into the archives and see an INU blog, I guess. Thank you. So make sure to follow all the artists and continue to support them. And I'd like to close this with thanking our artists for sharing your knowledge and experiences and your arts practice with us. Um, I'd like to thank our viewers at home for sharing this virtual space together, for Jamf for supporting us. Um, be sure to follow Nikkei Rising across all socials. We are at Nikkei Rising to stay up to date on events and programs. And that'll be wrapping up our panel. So thank you so much everyone for coming and have a good evening.